Okay, so I'm Alan Kahn. Uh, I'm currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Biology in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Leicester. That's not particularly uh, germane to what I'm going to talk about today because uh, I think what I'm going to talk about is quite generalized. Um, I'm going to talk about supporting researchers today. Uh, some of what I say is going to be applicable to undergraduate education, which is really my main interest, but I'm also postgraduate tutor in our department and um, also, as Steve said, has, have a long-standing interest in social tools and so this is something I've been thinking about quite a lot uh, over the last uh, few years. So if you want to get hold of me, my email address is on all of the slides um, or you can contact me via Twitter or at, at any of uh, the other places um, on, uh, uh, on this first slide. So as Steve said, if you want to raise points as we go along, uh, please do that in the chat box, but there will be regular gaps in the talk. I've left some gaps so that I shut up and I give other people a chance to have their say and hopefully we can get some discussion going. So um, <clears throat> let me give you a link first of all. Um, this is uh, a link to a paper that was published. Camera seems to have gone off. Um, Right, the camera's back. Sorry about that. This is a link to a paper which was published uh, by the Research Information Network last year. Um, and it was looking at how um, researchers um, use um, uh, social media tools. And the title was, uh, if you build it, will they come? Uh, and the answer was uh, pretty much no. Um, and um, uh, this is an area that I've been working in myself, supporting postgraduates and the colleagues here in Leicester and, and more widely for a number of years. And the reason I feel that I'm qualified to speak about this is that I've pretty made some fairly bad mistakes along the way. I've generally demonstrated lack of impact in what we've tried to achieve. So this is a, an illustrated guide to how not to engage researchers with social tools so that you don't have to make some of the same mistakes that, uh, that uh, I've made over the years. So in response to this, uh, paper, we approached RIN and asked if they would uh, be interested in publishing um, uh, not exactly a counter argument, but an alternative view on the value of uh, social tools for researchers. And I've just put the link in the chat box now. And um, they said yes, and so I'm very happy that that was published in February this year. And what we did in this report is to try and provide a warts and all approach to look at social tools for researchers. And as I said, much of this probably applies to undergraduates as well, although obviously the emphasis for undergraduates would be slightly different. Um, we've not tried to sell anybody a bill of goods. We've not tried to say that social media is an unmitigated um, benefit and that there aren't problems associated with it. Um, and so that's really what I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through some of the um, experiences that we've had uh, and how I feel um, the, the bad ways um, to try and engage people with social media. And then um, we can maybe share some of your experiences of what is more likely to work. So in the report that we wrote for RIN, we took a very wide uh, stance on what social media was. Social media is everything from blogging and Twitter all the way through to games and virtual worlds such as World of Warcraft and even including communication tools such as Skype and online tools and other tools that researchers can use to increase or enhance their productivity and to gain and to share knowledge. So uh, for the rest of this talk, um, pretty much nothing is ruled out. If it's social, if you can contribute towards it, then it counts as social media. Now, the way we structured the RIN report was to um, 
find 10 very kind people who were prepared to be interviewed by us. And we used them as case studies because we thought rather than uh, just giving a dry and academic view of social media, um, it would be uh, much more useful to see how real practitioners, real researchers were using a variety of tools. And there's a number of interesting things fall out of that immediately. Firstly, no, no two people use the same tools. Everyone has a different galaxy of tools. Um, uh, and everyone uses them uh, in, in different ways, uh, by and large, and to different extents. So some people, like myself, are heavily wedded to Twitter, whereas other people uh, prefer other tools um, which allow them to take a more, um, uh, what should we say, a more nuanced approach, stand off uh, and control the flow of information slightly more. So Terry uh, from Leeds was kind enough to be uh, one of our case studies, and this is his quote from the report. Um, and so um, he made uh, a nice, strong, positive case for uh, social media and how researchers could use that. But I want to go back to the last seminar. I don't know how many people here were um, in the uh, NetSkills seminar a week ago, given by Dave White. Um, but Dave, um, two years ago at the Alt Conference, um, gave a talk uh, based around this theme of visitors and residents, which has been very influential for a lot of people, uh, myself included in that, which shaped the way we think about social media and, more to the point, the conversations we have about people who are new to social media. And the analogy that Dave used is of visitors and residents. So on the left-hand side of this slide, we have the visitors. And the characteristics of uh, a social media visitor is that they, they view the internet or the web as a collection of different tools. So they're not really seeing it as an extension of their own personality or as an online identity. They're just seeing tools, one after the other, separated from one another. Um, they either require or expect everything to be authoritative. And very often, people who are new to this sort of approach uh, are uncomfortable with the informal chit chat that goes on, which, in fact, a number of studies have shown to be very significant in network building and in binding people together. So the jokes and the jokey hashtags on Twitter and these things actually do have a serious function. There is data to back that up. The biggest switch of all is from a private one-to-one -one or one-to-few mode of communication, typified, of course, by email, to a more public approach. And while most of the tools that presently exist do allow you to send private messages or keep your status updates private, that's generally not the best way to get the most out of these tools. So these are individuals who are working in isolation, and they're very goal-oriented. They may create a Twitter account and expect it to revolutionize their working practice. Well, clearly, it's not going to. Um, it, it's not going to work like that. It requires investment over a substantial period of time. So the contrast of that on the right side of this slide are the social media residents. And the social media residents have a more holistic uh, a, a view of their online existence. They regard the web as a space where they interact with other people. So rather than just a, simply a collection of tools, uh, they are indeed social and they are happy to talk to people and, and have two-way conversations. Um, they are communal. They do share a lot. They, they don't regard themselves as in competition with other people. Um, and they are prepared for things to change because, as we know, the technologies in this field are e evolving very, very rapidly. Um, and um, so um, uh, as um, tools change, it's quite possible that we may discard tools in um, 18 months' time. If Twitter decides it's going to commercialize its offering, we may not feel that Twitter is a particularly appropriate tool for education much longer. Um, uh, we may feel that um, we want to move our conversation somewhere else. So um, this is a... Um, I, and I, I recommend people follow the link. I can put the link up to Dave's video. Thank you very much for that, Dave. And you may want to, who oh, he's already done it. Um, so um, you may want to bookmark uh, this and go and watch it later, preferably not while I'm talking. But it's up to you if you want to go and do that. So uh, visitors and residents is the analogy that we use. 
And Clay Shirky, um, in uh, a recent uh, blog post last year, said uh, participants are different. When you participate, your presence matters. There is something that is, is quantifiably different between a visitor and a resident and a participant and someone who is merely an observer but doesn't contribute anything. And Cameron Nalen from Daresbury, who was another one of our case studies in the RIN report, uh, he gave us this quote. Um, uh, he, he, he's just talking, again, we're talking up social media at this point uh, and the plus sides. We will come to the downsides. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, we will come to the downsides um, of social media shortly. But there is a mindset for people who may only have used email uh, previously and who are very uncomfortable in having public conversations. It, this is something very, very new to them and it is a challenge I've found when we're trying to encourage people to be, to op to be open and to share and to be collaborative, particularly uh, in terms of uh, sharing resources with what in some cases people perceive to be their competitors rather than collaborators and, and that's something to be aware of when you're training people. Now, Let's come on to the downsides because, as I said at the beginning, we, we didn't in the RIN report present uh, social media as an unalloyed good. There are problems. <clears throat> there are issues. There is um, a, a quite reasonable conversation to be had around the influence of technology in education and, and people's personal lives. And uh, is are, are we guilty, am I in particular guilty of techno-determinism? Am I driven by the technology rather than any overall educational or pedagogical aims? I like to think that, um, uh, that I'm not, but uh, I'm always welcome when someone charges me with that because it does enable me to go back and, and rethink uh, my practices. There are issues, of course, around privacy, and most of the conversations in the media revolve around privacy on Facebook and the various atrocities that Facebook regularly perpetuates. But um, there are, of course, bigger issues uh, around data, data sharing. If you're writing a thesis on a particular area, do you want to share all of the, all of the uh, uh, ideas, all of the intellectual property in your thesis prior to formal academic publication? There are things to consider here. The usual quote that's a, a charge that's raised against social media is that of banality. It's just about people talking uh, or saying what they had for breakfast. And uh, indeed, uh, that is the case in some cases. But um, if that is your problem, if you can only find people on Twitter who are talking about banal things, then uh, you probably need some assistance curating your network of people that you follow to find a better network um, that will uh, serve your purposes better. Peripherality, it, is this absolutely central to what academics do and researchers do? Um, uh, you know, are there better ways of doing this? Can't you just send me an email is a comment that a colleague of mine has said more than once, a uh, plaintive cry. Um, and loss of the authoritative perspective, as, as I've said, the, 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 the gold standard of peer review in formal academic publications has gone out of the window uh, in social media, although there is a sort of informal post-publication peer review that goes on on some media. Um, and obviously that's something to be aware of. We know that there are erroneous facts published on Wikipedia, but at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of information on Wikipedia and if you're just scoping something out. Uh, so for example, I was having a vigorous argument with my children uh, at the weekend about um, uh, off-throttle hot-blown diffusers in Formula One and it was Wikipedia that set us straight and solved our argument for us. And then there's the issue of the work-life balance. If you, if you get into this stuff and you find it useful, and uh, particularly if you buy yourself an iPad, that is very much a slippery slope. Uh, will your work-life balance be adversely affected? And uh, Cameron in the RIN report said, uh, yeah, you know, you need to be careful about this. It's not always healthy to be connected. Uh, now, that may not be the immediate problem uh, that 
we face when we're training people who are new to these technologies is more of, more of a threshold issue. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, as, as someone who's heavily invested in this, this is an issue that I recognize that I need to deal with. And uh, Constantina, who's uh, a lecturer in ancient history here at Leicester, uh, gave us this quote, uh, that uh, you're always in the spotlight. You need to be very um, wary of what you say. Uh, you need to be guarded in some respects. So that apparently social informal chit chat uh, may be more than what you think it is. So it, th these are complex media. They're not that simple. OK, so I'm going to take a break uh, at this point and invite questions either via the chat box and uh, also or, or via audio. If you like to put your hand up, we'll give you the microphone. Um, and also, um, uh, if you'd like to share your experiences, if you've got anything relevant to say. Okay, pressure to keep feeding the machine. Is that, is that your issue, Steve? Is that what your wife says to you? It's what my wife says to me when I'm sat with my iPad in the evening. Yeah, get off that thing. But she's yeah. got her own now, so I don't get so much pressure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that's the answer. Buying every member of the family an iPad mm. may not be the right answer. No, I, I should just point out other devices are available. Um, <laughs> because it, yeah, but sorry, I, I just wanted to get a bit of discussion going and, and chip in. Please, everybody else, do do feel free. It's just something I personally feel, um, or a professionally kind of requirement to be involved in social networks almost. Um, but I do find it extremely useful, and it's a, something that I'm willing to compromise on. But you have to define your own boundaries and decide how, how far that goes. And you do sometimes notice, like being on holiday for a week, putting it down became a, a challenge. After three days, you break the back of it, and uh, sometimes it's hard to come back in after that. Okay. I'm not giving anyone else the privilege of the microphone, which I'm more than happy to do. So please chip in text wise or microphone wise. Uh, so somebody um, wanted to go back. Sorry, I don't know who JS is. Uh, somebody wanted to go back to um, a previous slide. Um, if you can describe the slide, I'm happy to go back. Chris, yeah, um, there is there is a difference between lurking and engagement. Of course, Jacob Nielsen has been banging on for over a decade about this participation inequality idea, this 95-5-1 distribution, 1% 1 of the people give give 95% of the, the content. And um, uh, um, th there are always, in, in every social tool that I've ever encountered, a, a vast majority of lurkers like an iceberg below the waterline. But as, as Clay Shirky said, participating is a different process once you actually start to contribute. And there are many barriers for contributing. People, in some cases, are protecting their privacy. But the most common barrier that I've come across is people feel that they don't have anything valid or important to say. They feel that they are not um, worthy. Um, uh, so um, they. Um, you know, don't feel that they can uh, contribute on an equal platform uh, to everybody else. So um, the answer to that is, um, yeah, lurking, lurking is OK. Um, I accept that. Um, it's not as valuable as, um, uh, as, as I think, participating in conversations. Um, and I think people should be encouraged to participate if, if they feel comfortable doing so. And lurking is certainly a very good way to start. Uh, when, when we start uh, using new tools, I would certainly encourage people to, to lurk um, uh, before diving in uh, with both feet. So, OK, shall we, are there any other points? Shall we move on? The, the slides um, and the, a recording of the session um, uh, will be available um, uh, after the talk, later in the week, I think. So you will get access to all of the slides later. And, and yes, Sue, so I, I agree. Um, it is really all about asking questions, absolutely. OK, so um, I think we will press on. There will be more opportunities for discussion. Uh, shortly. So,
Um, we, uh, as really an aid to our own thinking, when we were writing um, the um, report uh, for RIN, we, we drew up this little, little diagram, uh, which we rather grandiosely called the academic research cycle. So we, we split academic research into four stages, identifying knowledge, uh, creating knowledge, uh, the whole issue is around quality assurance, such as peer review, and then disseminating knowledge, which is probably the area of social media which has got most attention. People saying, well, you can establish your reputation, you can make a name for yourself, uh, be that good or bad. But we wanted to look at, uh, as I said, we wanted to take a more holistic view of social media, and we wanted to look at all of these stages. And um, the thing I would say, um, uh, as I've said previously, is there, there is no right way to do social media. It is a highly individualistic thing, and, and that, to me, is one of the most encouraging things about social media. Um, it's not one size fits all, and people's personalities really come through, and, and I think that's a, that's a tremendous advantage of this medium over what has preceded it before. Um, so accepting that there's no single or correct way of doing social media, but, and at the same time accepting that there probably are ways that you can get it wrong, um, then um, what, what we said was um, uh, clearly you can use social media to identify knowledge, as, as, as Sue said uh, in the chat box. You can, you can ask questions. It's probably the most fundamental, but uh, an extremely important use for um, uh, social media. Somebody asked on Twitter um, last week, what's the most important social media? media tool that you use, and I think the majority of responses I saw said Twitter. Now, okay, it's biased because it was on Twitter, but I would probably agree with that. And yet, when I first saw Twitter, I thought the limitations imposed by 140 characters made it effectively worthless. I, I thought, well, you know, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I can't see any value in this at all. And yet, Twitter is now my primary channel of communication. Over the years that I've been using Twitter, I've built up a network of people such that um, if um, uh, I uh, want to ask a question uh, in a field where I'm completely naive, where I really know very little, uh, if I can find the right way of phrasing the question, Twitter will, where, where, will be where I go first and foremost, certainly before I start emailing people and asking people questions and intruding on their time that way. Creation of knowledge, well, Twitter is collaborative, uh, and, and, and all social media, at best, is collaborative. And this is where the issue of lurkers comes in. Lurking is certainly um, uh, certainly a valid uh, approach to learning how to use particular tools. But forging collaborations with people and drawing on expertise um, is uh, probably the most valuable, uh, one of the most valuable things. I think all of the last four or five grant applications that I have written have all come out of my social networks, various social networks, overlapping to various extents as they do on different tools. So uh, after the thousands of hours, I'm very frightened to say I've invested in social media over the last five or so, five to seven years. It's now slowly starting to pay me back. It's now giving rise to knowledge and collaborations and expertise that I don't have. But when you're training someone who's new to social media who hasn't used it before, of course, that's quite a hard sell because they're not going to get that overnight. Hopefully with support and being able to plug their them into the right professional network, it's not going to take them seven years to reach the point that I've reached. Um, but um, clearly, they're not going to create a Twitter account and write a grant application on the back of it the following day. So there is an investment required, um, the, the, you know, and, and I think people have to be accepting of this, that um, uh, it, it isn't going to be an immediate payback. Uh, it, it does take time. Quality assurance, um, uh, there are issues around quality assurance. Uh, social media it, it does not operate in the same way as, as formal academic communications, conferences. Uh, it is more like the chat, as somebody said in the chat box just now, it is, it is more like the chat uh, during the coffee breaks at a conference in many ways uh, than a, a peer-reviewed academic paper. And yet at the same time, of course, many people would say, well, actually, you know, some, some, some conferences I've 
I've been to, the coffee breaks are the best bit. Talking to people in the bar um, is um, uh, maybe the best uh, uh, part of, of going to a conference. So uh, this is a way of reducing your costs. Maybe you don't need to go to quite as many conferences. There are virtual conferences becoming increasingly popular. And you can reduce your carbon footprint, of course, as well. And dissemination of knowledge, of course, uh, dissemination of knowledge is all about um, uh, building your own profile, which again is something that will pay you back. Um, you might ultimately be offered jobs, positions, if people are aware of you and the work that you do. Now, that's not to say relentless self-publicity is a good thing. I've unfollowed more than one person on Twitter in my time because I just couldn't take their relentless uh, um, self-publicity any longer. Um, so obviously one needs to do this with some subtlety. You don't want to be the bore at the party that corners people in the corner and, and doesn't let them get away. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, don't be uh, afraid to tell people about the work that you're doing and your interests and, and what you're interested in discussing. Okay, so uh, some issues there. Uh, I'm going to open the mics up again. If you'd like to uh, raise a, ask an audio comment, put your hand up. We'll give you the microphone, or use the chat box. Thank you for providing some support in the chat box, showing Dave's uh, visitors and ready uh, the correct link for Dave's uh, visitors and residents video. Well worth watching, as I said previously. Okay, so we've got a request. So, Alistair. No? Sorry, Al, if, if you do want to speak, you just need to okay. click the microphone icon at the bottom left of your screen or control okay. left to, to activate the mic. Hello. 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 Hi, Hi, who's this? Um, my name's Cherie. I work at Newcastle University. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi there. I'm going to be the only person that's responsible for the school website. And I'm worried that if I start on Facebook or on Twitter, mm -hmm. I'm going to be the only person doing it. And I'm, I'm worried it will start to take over my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, how can I get around the, the problems of not having to, to answer people's questions at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday evening or <laughs> 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I don't know whether, I mean I know it, it probably will be worth it but I'm just scared of taking that first step and how it is going to affect my life. I don't have a Facebook account, I've tried to avoid it like the plague. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to do was get was get a Facebook account. But yeah. how do I? I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay. Well, I I think first of all, you, you know, it's an entirely valid concern because there is an issue there. Um, I think if you're working in a formal capacity on behalf of an institution rather than working uh, for yourself as an individual, as it were, yeah. you're entirely justified in in setting some expectations and setting some hours. So I think the first thing I would do is publicise uh, as widely as possible through the medium that you're responsible responsible for the hours that you work and or the times when people can reasonably um, expect uh, right. a, a reasonably quick response. And it, cause it, it's obviously quite unreasonable for people to expect 24-7 support from, from an individual. Right. Um, and do people accept those grant boundaries? Do they, do they stick to yeah, those? I, or I, it's I, like, I, well, if she can't be bothered to be online at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday evening, then, then I'm not going to bother, you know, no, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want it to be detrimental to the university because I'm not online at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday evening, do you see what I mean? I mean, it, dep I don't it want depends what the... It depends what the service is that you're offering, but I mean, if it's not a, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think there are many things that go on on institutional websites that probably can't wait until nine o'clock or nine thirty the following morning. Uh, it's not sort of, it's not an emergency service. Presumably, you're not going to be dispatching ambulances or no. doing anything of that sort. So, no. I, I think it's entirely reasonable to to set office hours essentially. Right. Um, it's just mainly for students that that are coming into the university. Hmm. You know, you know, they've got all these kinds of questions, and then they're not yeah. only online well, during office hours. 
Well, well, the, our, the, the approach that we've taken with students over the, the last couple of years here is to try and encourage the formation of peer networks. And it's, ah, from, from my right. point of view, it's not so much the time of day thing as the, um, uh, the, the business of um, uh, not really wanting to answer the same question 50 times right, uh, when, yeah. when another student is quite capable of, of answering and, and, and in some cases has more up-to-date information than I do and, and can answer it better. Uh, yeah, um, a question, a comment from Dickon in the um, uh, uh, um, uh, chat box. I do recommend Hootsuite. Uh, it is a very good tool, uh, very useful. Okay. Uh, the, other, the other tool I would recommend looking at for managing this stuff is TweetDeck as well, another, another very good tool that allows you to manage multiple things such as Twitter and Facebook and um, other accounts. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I hope that, I mean, I don't have a magic wand to wave and, and say all of your colleagues are going to be entirely reasonable. Right. Um, but it, it, in the absence of that, hopefully, uh, you know, I don't know what other people think about this. Maybe some responses in the yeah, chat Yeah, there box. is actually. Thank you yeah. very much. It's kind of put my mind a bit. Try, well, but I, think, I think what I'm trying to say is use the social nature of social tools to get other people to answer the questions yeah, for you. But, yeah. Because because that is the multiplier effect of, of social tools. And if, if you're not plugging into that, it's not really social. Right, gotcha. Thank you very much. Cheers. Brilliant. So Dave, Dave has an invisibility quote. Uh, that, that's probably worth having. So, okay. So I'm mindful of the time here. So I think uh, we will go on to the next section if everybody's okay. Anyone got a burning question they need to ask right now? Can't wait until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll press on then to the to the next session. Uh, yeah, um, uh, a comment from uh, Will Allen. Yeah, it, it working. Uh, you know, what what is your role within the institution, and what will the institution reasonably expect of you? These are bigger questions than social media. Uh, you know, Lester right now has an early retirement scheme, and quite a lot of my colleagues are going to disappear at the end of July, and yet the workload hasn't gone down. Uh, somehow, uh, their their roles are going to have to be fulfilled by other people, and I'm sure other people are in a similar situation to that. So, you know. Okay, so let me go back a step, as it were, and talk about the, the training issues and how we approach training. So we started doing this with colleagues uh, quite a few years ago now, and um, I, I think to summarize, uh, the early training events that we tried to organize were characterized by their complete lack of success. We really didn't manage to convert anybody to using the social tools. We stood up and lectured them for an hour on the benefits of these tools and, um, uh, 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 and you know, the, the potential benefit as we saw it and how we used them. And yet, um, uh, no, no takers really, no, no sale. Um, we, we didn't see any con significant conversion rate from those sessions. And so the approach that I now take when I'm talking about this and trying to train people is to try and de-emphasize tools as much as I possibly can. So whereas previously we would have done a session on Delicious or a session on Twitter, we don't do that anymore. We talk about this in the context of personal net networks. We talk about how you build, how you curate a personal network. And then tools come in almost as an afterthought. And the tools come can be tailored um, uh, to how people like to receive information. Uh, you know, Twitter just absolutely freaks some people out. They just can't deal with it. Uh, and, and other people uh, do not want to be involved with Facebook for entirely understandable reasons, whereas you know, there are yet other people who are, um, uh, um, uh, who would like Facebook to be their major conduit for information and they're not frightened to mix their personal life and their professional life up on Facebook. Now I have to say that the stance I've taken on Facebook is um, I, I have my friends restricted to uh, a rather small number of people um, and I've tried to keep it separate from my Twitter account which is very public. Um, and I've tried to keep it around my personal life. And yet, 
my professional life keeps breaking in. I go on Facebook and there's people who want to discuss grant applications with me these days. So there are, there are issues with keeping personal and professional identities separate, but it's probably a good principle to aim at. Now, there are tools which are specifically sold as professional tools, and if you search, uh, if you go onto Google News or Google and, and search with inverted quotes around this string, Facebook for scientists, uh, you'll see any number of these things. Uh, that every two or three months, someone's given a substantial amount of money to write Facebook for scientists. Um, this is a completely flawed approach. Um, these purpose tools built around very constricted walled communities uh, are doomed to failure. And the reason I know that is people have been doing this for years and none of these things have been successful. The only way this is, can be uh, deemed to be any kind of success is that some people have give, been given some awfully big grants to write these things, but they're never going to work. We need to plug into public networks uh, where uh, uh, people's uh, conversations are going on. Again, we're back to visitors and residents. Uh, a, a professional network where nobody talks to each other in the evening but is too busy to talk to each other in the daytime um, is, is just uh, never going to be successful. But nevertheless, we have these things. We have ResearchGate, we have Graduate Junction, we've got Method Space, the Nature Network, we've got all these things. And then in a more general sense, of course, we've got LinkedIn, which is a social network and has recently, over the past six months or so, introduced more real-time social features into itself, just as Facebook did uh, 18 months ago um, after it um, acquired FriendFeed. But um, I would still encourage people to think about network building and curating personal networks um, rather than um, uh, um, uh, any purposed tool, unless there happens to be something in your particular academic discipline that I'm not aware of and maybe is only appropriate for a taxidermist or, 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 or whatever your chair happens to be in. Um, but um, you know, generally speaking, I would guide people when I'm training towards the public tools. Uh, and the corollary of that, of course, is people need to be very wary about what they're saying and, and, and aware that they're presenting themselves in a professional context as well as in a personal context. So a couple more quotes from the RIN report. Uh, Anna from Bangor, chemistry lecturer. Um, uh, Anna, like me, um, is a big fan of uh, FriendFeed. Um, also, um, Alan Salt, who was a PhD student here at Leicester but has now moved on, talking about um, uh, you know, public versus private, that what, what content are people um, uh, posting and, and what content are people happy to post and how what kind of risk analysis do you need to do before you post about the work that you're doing on a public social network. So these are the sorts of things that we consider when we do social media training for PhD students um, or for academics these days. And this is why we think the case studies uh, in the RIN report can be valuable to people because we, we, you know, they do draw some of these things out. Okay, uh, dot rural, FriendFeed is at friendfeed.com. Com. It's a social network which was started a number of years ago by uh, a number of um, ex-Google employees um, and um, in the summer of 2009 was um, bought by FriendFeed, sorry, by Facebook. They both begin with F, I always get confused. And if you've got a Facebook account, if you're a Facebook user, all of the changes that you've seen over the past year or so on Facebook, the, the news feed and the way that your wall now works as what's called an activity stream with the, the most recent activity coming back to the top of the page um, is the architecture that um, uh, 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 people, uh, uh, that, friend feed, that Facebook took from FriendFeed. And I think, uh, no, I don't. Okay, that's another talk. Um, I have another talk um, about um, uh, FriendFeed, but that's probably for another day. Um, well, one thing I would say is we use FriendFeed with undergraduates because we don't want to intrude on what most of them regard as purely a social space and, and that's what Facebook is for the majority of people. Now there are ways of using Facebook that doesn't 
uh, doesn't access people's personal information. So I'm a huge fan, for example, of um, uh, what are known as Facebook pages. So um, let me give you uh, an example um, of that. Uh, I'll just paste a link in for you. Um, so here, here's a here's a link to um, a Facebook page, and there are 900 or so people that um, like um, uh, this page, like being the technical term for connect with, um, and yet I don't know any personal information about those people other than their names or whatever they've made their public profile on Facebook. So there are ways to use Facebook to connect and to have discussions and to share links and files, um, but generally speaking with undergraduates, we've taken the approach that it's easier to have an entirely separate nature, uh, sorry, network using FriendFeed rather than Facebook. So people have a different mindset when they log on to that website. And that's, that's worked very well for us, I have to say. We haven't really had any crossovers. We haven't had people boasting about um, how much they had to drink the previous night. Uh, they have really restricted it to academic content. So, is, is, are there any more questions, or shall I do the last section? Okay, so time's going on. Uh, please feel free to just raise issues in the chat box if you want to, but I'm going to carry on. So, um, this is the last section. We're on the home stretch now. Um, uh, comment that um, uh, often uh, um, is made um, is uh, it's not information overload, it's filter failure. In other words, if you are drowning in information, it's your fault. Now, that's not entirely accurate, of course. Uh, we're all drowning as academics, and even not as academics, just in our personal lives. We're drowning in information, and social media is not going to solve that problem for you unless you curate a network which acts as a filter, unless your network is constantly flagging up the most important content for you that you need to be aware of, that you need to be reading in a timely fashion, unless your network um, is helping you to manage this burden of information overload. So um, filtering is, is a huge issue for all, uh, I think everybody, not just academics, but um, uh, um, certainly uh, social networks can help with that, but it's not a given. You have to get it right. Um, Something that's been discussed a lot currently is this issue of filter bubbles. It's what we used to call the echo chamber, but there's, there's a book just published by someone called Ellie Parser, and um, I've put together some links uh, on this uh, hyperlink in the chat window um, about this idea of filter bubbles, and there's a TED video. And the idea is uh, an extension of this, this thing that's been said uh, for a few years, is social media just an echo chamber? Is it just full of people telling you what you want to hear. Well, of course, it can be. Um, if you populate your personal networks online with cronies and, 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 and people who are too cozy, um, then that's what you'll get. Clearly, diversity uh, is important, and um, there's a reference. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I am going to give you some homework. There is going to be a test on this presentation, sorry. Um, but um, I, I will give you a reference at the end about network diversity and how you achieve this. Um, it's what I said earlier. Um, I, I'm actually really happy when someone charges me or accuses me of techno determinism because it makes me go back and think about my practices again. Have I have I got the balance right? Um, am I am I doing it uh, the right way? And networks are complicated things, as I've as I've begun to realise as I've delved more deeply into this um, in in the last year. And this is a, a diagram based on uh, Clay Shirky's work. Um, so um, the, the, in the top here we have bad networks, and they're bad networks because every node in this network, or every person, I suppose if you prefer to think of them like that, is connected to every other node. Um, and what that generates, quite frankly, is spam. Every time somebody sends a message, the entire network sees it, and it's bad news. You know what this is? This is the person who never learned what the reply to all button is in an email client. This is that person that you really, really hate. 
Good networks are shown in the bottom diagram. And uh, the bottom diagram is um, represents a network which will filter content for you, which is what I was talking about previously. And there's a world, there's a description of this. These are called small world networks, where you have these clusters of nodes or individuals. And those individuals, those clusters, um, are where most of the interaction happens, because that's where most of the content relevant to you will be located. But they also are connected by key individuals who interconnect different networks. And those networks may represent academic interests, or they may represent geographical locations. They may represent institutions, for example. So the big cluster in the middle with you at the center of it might be the people that you talk to at your university or your college or, or, or your place of work. Whereas um, you know, more distant clusters might be people from other uh, institutions, or they might be other academic disciplines which have an overlap with yours but are not the same as yours. So by creating networks with this small world structure, um, this is how we filter information efficiently. And a couple more quotes on the RIN report. Uh, Chris Jobling, you, you know, you don't, uh, it's not the same thing as Facebook friends. This, this term friend that Facebook uses, I think, is incredibly unfortunate. You don't have to have met these people. The people you need in your network are the people who have established their credentials online through posting quality content which is relevant to you and being able to answer your questions in a timely fashion when you've got one. Those are the people you want in your network. And I don't think those are really friends, but they are, they are the sorts of people that form personal networks and will make these technologies work for you. And, and as Terry said, you need to respect and be confident uh, of the people in your network. You need to trust them to give you the right answers when uh, you ask them a question. Not trust them without checking, of course, but you know, uh, be reliant. If you're going to rely on them for answers, it's nice if they're going to tell you the right thing. So I did say um, there was some homework. Uh, so this is your homework, is to uh, read these talks. No, uh, uh, only joking. If anyone is interested, there is now quite an academic field building up around this. I'm not just talking about the graph theory of network analysis, which I'm slowly becoming submerged in. But these are some great um, pieces of work. And I think if a colleague came to me um, and said, you know, I, don't, I really don't get this social networking thing. I really need to get over this. I would recommend that they read these three books. First is David Weinberger's Everything is Miscellaneous. That was one of the first books I read in this area. And that really, the light bulb went on when I read that book. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. Clay Shirky's Here Comes Everybody, um, highly intelligent book about networks and filtering, very readable, very accessible. And lastly, James Sirawak. Wecky's The Wisdom of Crowds, um, uh, an interesting book um, about thinking about network curation and uh, curation, I mean, sorry, and filtering. And, um, uh, you know, um, hopefully that will help with um, uh, setting up uh, a good network. So um, that's it. That's the talk. Um, happy to answer questions in the remaining time, uh, either by audio. Just click the microphone button at the bottom left of the Illuminate window, or ask in the chat window. OK, Alan. Well, I, I realize that you have to shoot off fairly soon for your next commitment. I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation, and to the people who do need to also get off from lunch or meetings to do that. Um, I'm going to hang around with you if, as for as long as you are, so I'll be here for mm -hmm. a few more minutes. But if anybody wants to leave, just say, please do so. And uh, if you want to express your thanks to Alan or ask any questions, again, please do that. Uh, OK, question from Jez. How do you manage to focus on the networks rather than the tools? Um, well, it's not easy. Um, uh, I, I think once someone has grasped this approach to network creation, uh, rather than uh, uh, simply which button do I press to do what. Uh, and, and obviously, that's going to vary a lot depending on, on what uh, sort of uh, people you're talking to. Generally speaking, talking to PhD students, these technologies are not foreign to them. Uh, in, in fact, in some ways, um, students can be over-familiar with these technologies and feel that they have nothing to learn. 
And they make possibly some of the same mistakes that they make on Facebook. In other words, they're not sufficiently selective. They just friend everybody. And that doesn't filter. And that's not really what we're seeking to achieve here. So um, th there are some issues. This question from Sarah about training researchers to use social media. Um, I, I don't know. Um, maybe we can't train anybody to do anything. Maybe we can only lead people towards the point uh, at which their own personal light bulb goes on. I think everyone who's, who's immersed in social media could probably describe to you a moment where that happened to them. They suddenly saw, oh, I get it. OK, this isn't just a toy. I can use it for this, that, or the other, or whatever it may be. But um, it, it, it's difficult training people in these things because there's not necessarily an immediate and short-term payoff. Uh, in, with some tools, there is social bookmarking tools. You can potentially treat people, uh, teach people how to find information relevant to their thesis or whatever it may be relatively quickly. But with, with the more conversational type tools, things like Twitter, that, that's more difficult. You know, it, 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 people do have to uh, uh, spend some time uh, investing in this. OK, point from Alison about uh, investing intellectual capital in a, in a commercial tool. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. And that doesn't just apply to Facebook. Um, it really applies to all of these tools. Uh, there are, in some cases, open source versions of these tools around. And um, if you've got um, a real um, uh, um, uh, privacy concerns, if you're working in a commercial environment, for example, you probably don't want to be working in public spaces. Um, but um, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think what my stance on this is that these people are providing a service for free. So if Facebook wants to show me adverts for baldness cures and make some sort of commentary on the content that I'm posting, then I go along with that um, because it's offering me a service. It's enabling me to talk to microbiology students from all over the world on the Microbiology Bytes page. And it's not charging me a penny. So. Um, yeah, I suppose if you sup with a devil, use a long spoon. But yeah, th these are issues. I, I think you have to be prepared. In, in each case, uh, Brian Kelly says, have a backup strategy. If you're going to use one of these tools as a major plank in your um, professional role, whatever that might be, always be aware that the tool could go away overnight or become unusable in some way. And therefore, you're going to have to migrate to another tool. And I'm constantly on the lookout for new social media tools, not just because I'm addicted to this stuff, but also because uh, I'm aware that you know these things might not be available. They might go away. And I might have to go and use something else. So good points. Uh, good blog post social threshold from Dave. As, as, as always, Dave White has, who has been very informative uh, to my thinking in these matters, has, has, has said it better than, and more eloquently than I can. So please read Dave's blog posts. I think that's what he's saying. So um, OK, any more questions? Uh, OK, question from Dickon. Uh, any useful resources to suggest to students to balance personal and professional? Uh, not really. Um, it, that's an individual thing. Um, I think that each individual has to find that out for themselves. Obviously, everyone's own balance is going to be different. Some people refuse to go online in the evening. And, and as I was joking uh, before we started this session, for me, buying an iPad, a piece of technology, has changed that balance. I would previously, when I worked on a desktop computer at home, I would routinely log off at 8 o'clock in the evening and then go and be social with the rest of my family. Well, I now go and be social with the rest of my family, but I do tend to have an iPad on my lap when I'm doing it. And it, and it has had a noticeable change on, um, on, on what I'm doing. So I think each individual has to find these things out uh, for themselves. Um, uh, Cost-benefit analysis question from Rob. Um, yeah, good question. I mean, I think I'm going to give you the same answer. Obviously, the cost-benefit analysis is something that will be different for um, everybody. Um, obviously, I would 
suggest to people that they don't dive in and you know discard every other tool that they've presently used. They they do it in an exploratory way and take time to build up a network and um, you know see if it starts to pay them back. Um, for me, it does, but but you know it may, it may not for everyone. Okay, folks. Um, uh, I hope it's been valuable. Uh, I do have to rush off to an exam board meeting. I apologize for that. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks very much once again, Alan, and uh, hopefully we'll carry these conversations on somewhere else another time. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for participating as well. Great stuff. Thank, thank you. you.